Hello, and welcome to the third installment of our CPF uh, Fellows Roundtable series. My name is Harry Burke. I'm the Fellows Manager here at CPF, and I will be your moderator today. Today's discussion is being broadcast through Facebook Live, and will be an episode on our podcast series, The Bully Pulpit, which can be found wherever you get your podcasts. Today, our panelists and USC students will engage in a thoughtful conversation around conservative media, its future, and we will dive into the pressing questions uh, to help us better understand the rights media ecosystem. I'm joined today by current and former fellows here at CPF. Ron Christie is the founder and CEO of Christie Strategies LLC and an analyst for the BBC. He was a special assistant to President George W. Bush and deputy assistant to Vice President Cheney for domestic policy. Ron was a CPF fellow during the fall 2019 semester. Todd Purdom is a renowned and longtime journalist. He recently wrote for The Atlantic as a staff writer and California correspondent. He was also a senior writer at Politico and a contributing editor at Vanity Fair. He was formerly with the New York Times where he worked for 23 years. And Barbara Comstock, who's joining us live from the uh, Potomac River right now, we really appreciate it, <laughs> is a former member of Congress from Virginia where she served from 2015 to 2019. Prior to serving in Congress, Barbara was elected three terms in the Virginia House of Delegates, and she's currently a senior advisor at Baker Donaldson, focused on technology issues. So the way this works is I have a few questions here, but we get a lot of USD students who submit questions, and they've done that over the last few days. I will kick it off with a question, but we will mostly have USC students that are going to be the ones asking the questions. We have a few live that are here, hopefully today on the webinar, and I have a couple that are written in that USC students uh, were not able to make it live today mm -hmm. to ask, so I'll read it for them. I will promote the live ones uh, to become panelists, so you'll see them uh, as a panelist on this webinar. Uh, ask their question, engage in a little bit of a back and forth if necessary, and then I'll send them back down to move on to the next question. We do accept questions via the Q&A chat uh, box at the bottom of your screen. Hopefully we could get to them if we have some time at the end. Um, but that will be determined on how many USC student questions we can get through. So my first question talking about conservative media is I really kind of want to understand mm -hmm. the uh, audiences that watch these conservative outlets or read these conservative publications, uh, because I think something that gets lost is especially people that maybe are people that predominantly look and read and watch mainstream outlets is why do people that are mostly predominantly a lot of them on the right, not trust the mainstream outlets like the New York Times, NBC, ABC, CBS, and gravitate towards the alternatives to those Fox News, uh, maybe Newsmax, OAN, uh, other things like that. Um, so I guess my, that is my question is why don't people on the right for a large portion of them trust those mainstream outlets? And maybe we'll start with Ron. Harry, thank you very much. And it's a, it's a thrill and an honor to be back uh, to USC, and we all wish that we could be there in person rather than virtually, but it's it's good to be with Barbara Comstock, a friend of over 20 years, and, and Todd Purdom, for those of you who have not read his book, uh, An Idea Whose Time Has Come, is the first book I teach every semester at Georgetown University about the civil rights movement, which is a great read. Now, that out of the way, let me say that I think for the last 20 years, there's been a sense that ABC, NBC, CBS, MSNBC, CNN are politically motivated in their coverage and that they seek to move an ideological narrative rather than report the news. And many conservatives over this 20 year period have gone to Fox News, yes, to look for news, but they also go to look to the opinion drivers, the Bill O'Reilly's when he was there, Sean Hannity, you can fill in any number of people. With the rise of the Tea Party, and Barbara can speak to this better than I can, and certainly with the presidency of Donald Trump, I think that you found people looking at the coverage of the president and saying, this is, this is enough for me. I'm gonna go to Hannity on the radio or television, or I'm gonna go to Newsmax, because I think that the folks who are on the news are trying to make the news. And that's something that many, many conservatives, whether you agree with that analysis or not, Harry, I think that's, that's what led to a lot of the migration to some of these other sites. Uh, do you wanna go next? Well, yeah, thank you. And it's good to be here with, with Ron and Barbara as well. And thank you, Harry, for leading this. Um, 
I, I think Ron is correct. I think the other thing that's a little bit unnerving for me as a veteran of the so-called mainstream media is to realize that um, institutions that were once seen as honest brokers in the middle of the media are really not seen that way anymore. I was a little bit shocked the other day to get from one of my SC students <clears throat> a reference to something called um, All Sides and its media bias chart. And it has these little bugs about where it ranks various outlets on the scale. And only the AP, Axios, a handful of other sources were in the middle and um, others were categorized as right or lean right. Or, and the New York Times was categorized not just as lean left, but left, meaning that this entity considered the New York Times' news pages to be left in its perspective from you know, the editorial page to the front page. And that's something, you know, for somebody who joined the New York Times almost 40 years ago, a kind of a shocking development. And I think partly that has to do with, with how the paper has positioned itself in the age of Trump as a kind of loyal opposition alternative voice to Trump's uh, view of the world. Uh, the fact that the, that the Times has used words like liar and, uh, or, you know, lie and and so forth, which, which internally caused a great deal of uh, sturm and drang in the paper. So yeah, I think that we have over the last 25 years and more reverted to something that was much more the norm in American journalism and politics and has always been the norm in world journalism and politics. And that is a press of advocacy and overtly partisan uh, views and reinforcement of the views of its readership instead of some kind of uh, objective uh, that that we there will be a, a, a non ideological sort of view of the world, which is something that grew up in America largely after World War II, and it turns out had a very brief moment in the sun. So I, I think now the one thing I would say in defense of institutions like the New York Times is that there's also been a concerted 25, 30 year longer campaign to paint uh, those once trusted mainstream sources as out of step and, and partisan. And the founding of Fox News with its slogan, Fair and Balanced, which was really a kind of a, it, it was a kind of thumb in the eye to the rest of the media. Uh, it, it was an overt audience driven gambit by Roger Ailes to say there's a, there's a ripe audience out there for this alternative view, which we will present uh, through our own filter uh, and reinforce the views uh, of our audience who aren't getting their views heard in the other media. So it, it's, a, I don't know which is the chicken and which is the egg, but I, I would agree that we're now in a place where most of the media of all stripes is seen as having a political edge one way or the other. And, and there's just, just as in our country and our culture as a whole, there's hardly any one institution that's universally trusted. There's virtually no media source that's universally trusted as, as an objective stater of the facts. That's just, that's just where we are. Barbara? Okay, well, and thank you. I'm live from my car here because I couldn't make it home in time because I was getting my second shot. So it's delightful to be with you. And I would agree with what has previously been said. And I would, I would date sort of the distrust that conservatives had really going back to Ronald Reagan's term. Mm -hmm. Because you, you had Ronald Reagan by his second term when he won 49 states, was still pretty assailed you know, by what was considered mainstream media. So you did have first the rise of talk radio and you know, Rush Limbaugh, obviously, then you had with Fox News, you had fair and, you know, fair and balanced, as Todd mentioned. But I would point out, even in the course of that, what Ronald Reagan did, which I think is smart, and which I certainly tried to do or would tell candidates to do, is just understand, yes, the media and the people who report probably do trend left, but you have to hold them, you know, the feet to the fire to be honest, present facts, and then you push back on that. The way Ronald Reagan did it is he went around the media and would go directly to the people and talk to local media. He'd go into local media, you know, when, when he won his second term, a lot of what he did is Michael Deaver took him around the country and did these exclusive interviews with somebody in Iowa or in, uh, you know, 
Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Florida. And that was more effective than having to deal with the gatekeepers. And one of the good things that I think happened from cable news, and we're still everything is still sorting itself out, is that there were no longer just a few gatekeepers. It wasn't the Washington Post or the New York Times or the three networks. You now had more cable news. And for conservatives, they felt like, you know, Fox News was more fair. Yep. Now, I will point out that, you know, initially Fox News was a dear friend of mine, you know, did the Sunday show, Tony Snow, who I, who honestly was very fair and balanced. And I think today, Chris Wallace is certainly still a very esteemed reporter and very fair mm -hmm. and, you know, evidenced by Donald Trump was attacking him and telling people not to watch him. You also have Brett Baer and other, you know, news reporters. I, I do think the news reporters on Fox still are. I mean, uh, you know, you go, um, who is it? Um, Neil, um, the financial Cavuto. reporter. Um, Neil Cavuto. Yeah, Neil Cavuto. Great, you know, very fair and balanced. And, you know, Shepard Smith actually left Fox because of that. So it really was this Trump assault on the media. And then I would add to this, which another thing that I think is actually good to get more voices out there is social media has kind of allowed um, everybody, you know, in political world to get around both cable and every talk radio and whatever else by going directly to the people and having your own media on Facebook, you know, on YouTube and being able to get directly to people. And that's something now you see um, many of the cable stations now attacking social media and being part of that, certainly Fox is. Um, the, and I would distinguish again from the Fox News people and a Tucker Carlson and a Sean Hannity, because I think there's a world of difference um, between a Chris Wallace who's still, you know, still very fair and balanced. So now you have this attack on social media because it does allow people to, again, cut through the filters and get directly to people. I think that is good, but you still have you know, this, this whole e extreme notion that's going on within cable where if you just want to see the you know, left-wing view of the world, you go on MSNBC, you know, the, the opinion shows, and then you do the same thing. I mean, Tucker Carlson is probably the worst offender of you know, just kind of no longer being news, but just blatant, not even opinion, but blatant agenda. And it's, you know, sort of, so it's, um, that has changed. But I think the good news for people is there are so many different outlets, you can turn it off. And that's, you know, when everybody complains about what it is, also, it's the people, those of us who are watching it or reading it, if we're not demanding facts, then shame on us. And we should be a part of correcting that. And the you know young people who now go more directly to sources and don't even watch cable or TV or networks, maybe they don't. You know they they're going to other sources directly to see things. I think C-SPAN is a great resource for that. Yeah. Plug C-SPAN. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to go to our first student question, and USC students. When you do get promoted, if you could uh, tell us your name, your year, and your major. Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Molly Solzer. I'm a senior double majoring in law history and culture and art history. And I just first wanted to say thank you all so much for speaking with us today. My question is about the role that consumers can have in stopping the spread of misinformation in the media. So as I'm sure you know, Dominion Voting Systems has filed a $1.6 billion defamation lawsuit against Fox News, saying that the network spread false claims that the voting machine company was involved in voter fraud during the 2020 presidential election. And Smartmatic, another voting system technology company, has also filed a billion dollar defamation lawsuit against Fox News. So other than the threat of lawsuits, what can we as news consumers do to stop the spread of misinformation from these large media organizations? Uh, do you want to take that first? I'm, hi, Molly. Good to see you. Um, and that's an excellent question. I think, you know, part of it is it, it really reflects what Barbara said in her, her comments, which is that uh, the profusion of outlets and options really is a kind of uh, freedom for the consumer and also uh, caveat emptor, buyer beware. 
So I think the, the most important thing people can do at, you know, at the think globally, act locally level is be educated consumers. Um, and, and be careful about the, you know, be discerning about the, the outlets that they read or the outlets that they watch. Um, I don't, I don't think it's easy for consumers en masse to, you know, to stop big, uh, powerful, you know, advertiser driven, subscriber driven entities, which have the resources. So, I mean, you're not, I don't, I don't think there's going to be some citizen boycott that could shut down Tucker Carlson. Although we, we see that, for example, Advertisers do shy away. I mean, ultimately, Glenn Beck was driven off Fox News and, and into his own world of, you know, um, uh, streaming uh, kind of uh, media because uh, of advertisers. So, I mean, it is possible, I suppose, that um, that there could be commercial pressure brought to bear on the most egregious examples of misinformation. But I think that the, the most important thing individuals can do is to be aware of the source that they're relying on and be skeptical and, and, you know, range widely across the available options and, and be, um, be a, a picky shopper. And, and, and I think that's the most important thing anyone can really do. We lost Barbara. So Ron, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I, I agree with Todd and Barbara on this and Molly, you're almost there. So congratulations. Um, I'd say two things here. One, I think Barbara was exactly right. You know, you, you can turn it off. And a lot of these folks and, and the world that, that Todd and, and I certainly play in, um, they run the numbers every 15 minutes or so to see who's up, who's watching, and who's down and who's not watching. And I think that you do have the power as a consumer to turn the channel to somewhere else or to turn it off. And advertisers pay very strict and rapt attention to what moves the needle and what doesn't. But Todd's other point, I think, is an important one, is that you also have the opportunity to recognize that there are these, there are folks in the industry on all the networks who are in the news business and there are folks that are in the opinion business. And I certainly don't go to watch a MSNBC or Fox for news if I'm watching an opinion maker. And you recognize that they're there to offer their opinion, but you have to draw a bright line between the news division and the opinion makers, because it's a huge gulf. Yeah, I have a quick question to build on what Molly said. I mean, I've heard, of, and I agree, turn off the stuff that's not helpful. But what about turning on, and especially with conservative media outlets? Like, are there any that are alternatives to Fox or or other outlets like that? That you guys like? For me, I usually read the Dispatch is a new kind of conservative outlet. I think it was started by. Um, uh, well, I forget who it was started by, but I love that outlet. Do you guys have any other recommendations or outlets like that um, that would be a good way to, to get a good uh, turn on a different news source? Well, I became during the campaign a real devotee of the Bulwark, which is largely Bulwark. created by a bunch of Weekly Standard alumni and, and you know, has as its leading light Bill Crystal and then Charlie Sykes, who was a conservative radio talk show host in Wisconsin, who became an early and really uh, unapologetic anti-Trump, never Trumper. And it's full of really thoughtful, I think, uh, commentary and, and rigorous analysis of pieces. And it's, 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 um, it's not reflexively, it, it's conservative in its orientation, but it's not reflexively any one thing. And it's heterodox. I mean, I think it's, a, it's full of uh, things that make uh, liberals or conservatives question their accepted beliefs, maybe. And as I said, the animating drive of it was anti-Trumpism and, and trying to reclaim uh, conservatism, you know, in its respectable traditional iteration. But it's just a very thoughtful, um, and, and it has a series of newsletters and podcasts and other kinds of uh, vehicles that sometimes the sort of they're Part of what they do is aggregate coverage from other places or Charlie's morning newsletter has a lot of aggregation. It talks about, you know, interesting things across the spectrum. Uh, it's just a, it's just a, to me, a very reliable way of putting a check on. And for example, its coverage of the recent Georgia law has been careful to point out the ways in which the motivation for the law was bad and the motivation for the law was, was rooted in Trump's big lie about fraud but it's also had a, it's pulled back from some of the more extreme liberal critiques of the law by pointing out 
the things it did do and the things it didn't do and the ways it could have been worse and so on. So I, I think it's just, I, that's for me become a, a place that I turn to uh, where I, I feel pretty sure that I'm gonna get a perspective I wouldn't necessarily think of by default. Anything to add, Ron? Yeah, I mean, I, I think Jenna Goldberg does a great job with the dispatch and, and I agree with, with uh, what Todd said about Bulwark. And, Molly, the only other one I would would point you to is Real Clear Politics, and and I write I like RealClearPolitics.com because it'll take a story like Todd just mentioned and talk about voting rights in Georgia, and maybe the first sort of column that they point to is written by Jesse Jackson saying you know this is racist, this is terrible, this is bad public policy, and the next article might be by Brian Kemp, the governor of Georgia directly refuting that. And they draw from Vox, they draw from Salon, they draw from conservative outlets. And it's certainly one of my first reads in the morning. I like seeing what the far left, the far right, and those in the middle are saying to sort of shape my day of kind of what's the narrative going to be and, and what are the folks really fired up today about. And it comes out twice a day. It's, it's, it's posted when I wake up and I think they refresh with new content at like three o'clock in the afternoon, 12 o'clock Pacific. Great. Well, thanks, Molly. We're going to head over to our next student, adding them right now. And again, if you guys could please list your name, your year, and your major when you guys come up. Hi, everyone. My name is Jenny Lee, and I'm a junior studying business. I'm currently coming to you guys from Milan at the moment. Um, my question for you all is, what top-down infrastructures are there in place, either in Washington or at mainstream media outlets, to combat bias in the editing or publishing process, or as news is coming out directly to the consumers? Todd, do you want to take that first, actually, since you worked in a lot of these publications? Well, I'm not quite sure I understand the question in terms of what top-down uh, uh, policies are in place to combat bias. I mean, there are some organizations that the top-down uh, imperative is to put in the bias. I mean, there's there's just no doubt about that. I mean, the opinion parts of, of the, you know, the opinion page of the Wall Street Journal or the opinion parts of MSNBC uh, th those people have a take. And I mean, if, you, if you're going to watch Rachel Maddow, uh, you know you're going to get the news through Rachel Maddow's. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I, I happen to think her, her takes are more intellectually honest than Tucker Carlson's, but they're, they're not uh, neutral. Um, whereas I think the New York Times would still describe itself as trying to, um, you know, keep overt bias out of its coverage and out of its news pages while acknowledging that its editorial page has this particular perspective. Uh, obviously not all consumers feel that way about the New York Times or the Washington Post. Um, so I think one of the things that has changed with audience metrics being such a dominant force in all of the media and the traditional mainstream media doesn't like to acknowledge this as much as um, some newer media does, but, but it, it is absolutely true, as Ron said, in, in all of these places, whether it's the Atlantic or the New York Times or CNN, you name it, everyone's looking at the clicks. And I'd like to hope that um, you know, stories are not commissioned uh, solely on the basis of being clickbait, but I know that headlines are written to be clickbait, even in the most traditional places. They, they test headlines to see which are the most clicky. Uh, and there are internal measurements and indices and newsletters and guide, you know, guidebooks written for the staff to make headlines uh, clicky. Um, so I, I think that's just a, a feature of life. I mean, I'm old enough to remember the days when the front page of the New York Times was literally drawn up by, you know, five or 10 or 15 white men and two women to, to say that, you know, the latest development in uh, the Soviet Union was the news of the day that was the spinach that people who were reading the New York Times needed to know whether they were excited by it or not and whether they would have rather read about, you know, O.J. Simpson 
uh, and those days are gone. They're gone for good in every, every media institution. So, um, but I'd like to hope that audience metrics are not the only thing people care about, that there's still, in the mainstream media, at least there still has to be a role for curation because in this wild, wild west that we have, what is the point of any one of these great institutions if it's not gonna, it's not gonna bring to bear its own discernment and say, these are the things that really matter today. I think you're on mute, Barbara. On mute. Okay. There you go. So one of the yeah. Sorry, I, I got disconnected. But um, one of the things that the audience can do and can be part of is um, sorry. Am I still there? Yep. Yep. Oh, sorry. Um, is that you can you can correct it in real time, and you've seen this happen quite often. Is when there are mistakes in mainstream media whether it's on TV or Tucker or, you know, the New York Times, you, the audience, and, you know, now that everyone's out there and has a microphone, you can correct it. Now, the better corrections are the ones that are very factually based, links to an actual source, or even better, you can put up, you know, um, you know, like right now you have the whole discussion going on about whether the, you know, to pack the Supreme Court. So you have, uh, you know, Joe Biden, you know, when he was in the Senate saying this was a dumb idea, don't do it, and you have him live saying it. And now, you know, you have people wanting to pack the court. You have, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, you have her saying that. So those are things that can offer information in real time and that anybody can go and do. And I think those, that's the value of social media. And I, you know, full disclosure, I, I work with tech. But I know as a candidate, that was a big help too. Not to pick on the New York Times, but they did report that I was at a hearing um, that I was not at and it, because it was part of a D, a, a D triple, a Democrat attack book on me. They had done a 500 page attack book and they said I represented this guy and I was at a hearing with him. Well, I got the C-SPAN footage and pulled it up and said, no, it wasn't me, it was actually Beth Nolan, who was a lawyer who had been a, a lawyer for Bill Clinton, who I was being un unfortunately mistaken for. And when I sent it to them, they were kind of like, well, we're sticking with our story. I was like, well, <laughs> does it doesn't matter if you're sticking with your story. Um, or actually, actually, the, the New York Times did correct it. The DCCC was still sticking with their story. So fortunately, the New York Times did not do that again once we sent them C-SPAN. But I was able, I, I can't remember if I did it, but I should have if I didn't in real time put up, here I, here's the hearing they're talking about. The New York Times took the DCCC's info and it was incorrect. So don't do that again. And one of the things you can do, and I think is very effective, if you discredit a source of information, they are not gonna wanna use you again. So discrediting the DCCC for putting false information that was easily verifiably false um, is a good, that's something that, you know, each, you know, competing parties can do to each other. And I think that is a good thing. Anything to add, Ron? I'm gonna come at this uh, slightly differently for my two colleagues here for, for being the North American political analyst for the BBC is that we are broken down, I suspect, a bit differently than American media outlets. So we have a North American political editor for the BBC whose focus is to look at our coverage uh, of politics in the United States and make sure that that coverage, to use the Fox terminology, is fair and balanced. And then we also have a uh, bureau chief for North America who looks at the stories that are filed by the reporters, by the folks on television, by the folks on radio, and are trying to make sure that they're being as fair as possible. And they do this, if, if you're in Milan, uh, the closest bureau to you would be Rome, where they've got the political editor and they've got the bureau chief that are trying to make sure that they are getting the story right. And the one thing that I appreciate about the BBC in this regard, and I think you've heard Barbara and Todd talk about this, is that you might think that you're one voice on social media, but they look, I, I can't speak to, to Facebook because I'm still in the Stone Age and don't have a Facebook account, but you know, they have very good quality control with Twitter of anything that I say on air, if people take issue with it, 
that it goes pretty quickly up to the brass. And it, it's, a, it's a good internal mechanism to make sure that the viewers and the listeners are responsive to the content that's going out for those of us who are being paid to offer political commentary. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't like what you hear or you don't like what you see, I think Barbara's exactly right. You know, reach out to them, demonstrate if what they've said is wrong or slanted or biased and prove that because mm -hmm. someone is watching that commentary and feedback and they'll think twice before booking them in for another interview. Well, and that's, and I, I got cut off before when we were talking about Dominion voting, that question there, but obviously that topic is not on the news anymore. And even when um, Donald Trump was speaking, you know, at the CPAC conference, I noticed that Fox didn't cover him live. Well, I guess they did, but they didn't cover much of that conference because I think they were concerned about having all this false information and even OAN and Newsmax and the, and the further right um, you know, news, news sources, they weren't covering a lot of it. Or when they were, they were saying, well, we're not saying any of this is true. You know, if these things were there, they now have their disclaimers in there. So the lawsuit in that case certainly did work. But, and you've seen people both on networks as well as cable who have lost their jobs for promoting misinformation. And usually that comes from, um, people in social media highlighting it and it gets, you know, it, it gets a life of its own. And then they, you know, the networks themselves or the news source, you know, print media, they have to decide how to deal with it, either defend the story and say, no, it's true, or, you know, figure out how they're going to deal with what might have been a mistake or whatever misinformation. But we have more resources than ever before to correct it in real time. So that's kind of what we all should be doing as informed citizens. Great, thanks so much for your question, Jenny. We're gonna go on to the next student question. And like the rest, please state your name, your year and your major when you get up to be a panelist. Yep, sorry, I'm here. Um, Hi, everyone. My name is Harrison Murphy. I'm a junior majoring in political science. Um, to the panelists, thank you all for being here today. So when many of us think of conservative media, the first thing that comes to mind is commentary programs like Tucker Carlson Tonight, which I'm sure many of you know is facing calls to be removed from the air. So my question is, do you think like these conservative commentary programs like Tucker will eventually be removed from air? And also, is that something that should even happen? Is there any value in their perspective? Ron, would you like to go first? You know, uh, Harrison, thank you very much uh, for, for that question. I think that those in the opinion business, whether it's Tucker Carlson, Sean Hannity, Rachel Maddow, you, know, you put your person of choice in there. A broadcast outlet has to make a very concerted decision of, am I putting somebody out there who is controversial? Am I putting someone out there who's gonna move the needle for ratings? Am I putting someone out there who is an opinion maker, but also an educator? I again draw the deep, deep division between opinion and the news division. And I think it's up to each network. I think Todd accurately talked and touched on this earlier that I think Glenn Beck became too much of a fringe individual, even for Fox News. And I think as a direct result, they sent him off into the ether world, wherever it is that he is now. But I think Fox News recognizes that Tucker Carlson and Sean Hattie, that, that makes a lot of money. And unfortunately, this is a money-driven business. And you know they're in the business of, of making money and those opinion makers move the needle. Rachel Maddow does a phenomenal job of counterbalancing uh, Fox News. And as a consequence, does very well with the commercials. So, I think you as an informed viewer and citizen have to say to yourself, I know the content's out there and Barbara said this first, do I wanna turn it off? Or am I watching this to sort of see how the other side thinks? I mean, I, I enjoy looking at some of these other programs to make sure that I understand where they're coming from. So I guess it, it depends on your perspective and what you're looking to gain by spending 10, 15 minutes watching 
any number of individuals on television. Well, I, I'll, I'll speak you know, for a lot of Republicans, and I would include myself, I just find Tucker Carlson unwatchable. It's not interesting anymore because it's just, it's predictable agenda, inflammatory, you know who he's going after, and he has the same guest. I think one of the great moments on Tucker Carlson that I did get to see, I don't, because I usually don't watch him, but, it, you know, because I, I saw it on Twitter, I, I did go watch it. Um, was when Matt Gates was on and you know, then tried to include Tucker Carlson in his scandal. You will notice that Tucker Carlson, who talks about cancel culture all the time, very quickly canceled Matt Gates. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the whole thing is, I, I think the audience is dwindling. I know so many Republicans who just say, I can't watch any of that stuff anymore. You know, they, they, they're going to still watch a Chris Wallace and a Brett Baer for news, but that I think they're, because younger people aren't watching any of uh, many of these shows at all they're on social media and they're very geared to you know particular content providers and i think so if young people who are a desired demographic um decide to tune out on these things then it will be a limited shelf life i mean i think that one of the things that happens is the marketplace tends to take care of these things eventually so as, as uh, Ron and I have talked, Glenn Beck became uh, not only too toxic to advertisers for his fringe theories, but he was so monomaniacal on the topics he cared about that Roger Ailes, who we have to remember started his career uh, you know, working for a Broadway producer as a showman, uh, Glenn Beck was unwatchable. He was boring. Uh, as Barbara points out, Tucker is becoming boring in the same way, the same predictability. And what has happened over time with these voices on, on the right, but on the left too, uh, dating all the way back you know, to Walter Winchell and Father Coughlin, when they become too extreme, when they become screamers, uh, Walter Winchell in ancient history got in a famous situation with uh, an incident involving Josephine Baker, the black entertainer at the Stork Club. And he pushed it too far for even his loyal audience. And in some ways it was the beginning of the end for him and his influence, his reach was really never the same again. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think what we, we and Bill O'Reilly went too far. Um, and people, people, after a while, there is a rough justice in this thing where there's a corrective that happens <clears throat> if people go too far. Keith Olbermann went too far on the left. He, he just became mm -hmm. a tiresome haranguer. And I think people got sick of it. So, so I, I would be definitely against any kind of uh, effort to take people off the air forcibly. Although I do think, I mean, I'm again, I, I'm dating myself, but there was something quaint about the fairness doctrine in which people really did have to give a time for opposing views on any given outlet. Um, and I think you know the end of that, in the name of the free market. Um, you know, it was a positive thing in many ways, but it also has had its downsides in terms of uh, the general responsibility of people keeping their broadcast licenses and so on. Um, so I, I, but I think that the, the best answer is the marketplace uh, of ideas and the, and the, the well, judgment you know, of the I, crowd. I, as I was listening to that, I was just thinking, you know, I was going through these different people who've gotten kicked off the air because of their extremists. They have all one thing in common, it's white men. And I think the uh, dynamic is changing that um, you have more diverse media voices now. And I think on the left and the right, I, I think they're, you know, and news sources, I think that's going to change things too. I think one of the um, news people who I think is fantastic, who just kind of came on the scene, you know, or got, she's been out there for a while, but is a real reporter is Abby Phillips on CNN. And she has done such good just, real reporting and going out into communities and bringing in stories and it's so refreshing and it doesn't matter what side of the political aisle you're on i think she really has a new you know it's a younger voice but it's also a voice that's just much more tuned in to a broader piece of the community and i think people like that getting rewarded are going to make a difference too so you know she's gotten her own show i i think you're going to see more um, people like that in the future, and that's it. And and so 
watch people like her reward that people who are really good diggers and reporters and very soundly go just the facts, ma'am. And that's, um, it, it, I, I have found her, you know, as one of those new refreshing voices and I, I, I hope we'll see more of them. Great, thanks Harrison. Uh, and we're gonna move on to our next panelist. And again, please say your name, your age and your major when you get promoted. From one Harrison to another. Yeah, great name. Hello. Another Todd student too. Racking up the students here today, Todd. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay, perfect. Hi everyone, my name is Gabe Romero. I am a junior studying political science. Um, and my question, um, well first, some popular conservative media pundits seem to give platform to and promote white nationalist and white supremacist rhetoric. Um, Tucker Carlson's been talked about a lot today. Um, and him, for example, he um, has recently come into the spotlight for his spreading of white replacement theory um, on his show something that both the Charleston church shooter and the El, pa or El Paso Walmart shooter wrote about in their manifestos. So my question is, um, do you believe he embraces white supremacist rhetoric? Is promotion of white supremacist, supremacist rhetoric something you see as a problem in some conservative media? And if so, what can be done in response? Barbara, do you have any thoughts on that? Sure. Um, well, Frank Luntz has always said, it's not what people say, it's what you hear. But in my opinion, in the case of Tucker Carlson, it's both, it's what he's saying, and it's what people are hearing. And so, yes, I, that's, that's certainly how I hear it. And I think there's been a lot of good factual analysis on it. And, and, that's, and that's part of why I think he is unwatchable. And, you know, then, but then he takes, you know, when people attack him on that, you know, he'll take, but again, it's, it's so tiresome. And, you know, his, his group of people, you know, there's a new caucus that is being started by Marjorie Green and, and a group of those insurrectionists. And, you know, they are promoting that same type of rhetoric from, it's not only toxic for, their, for conservatives in the Republican party, I think it's toxic for the body politic. And so it's, it's just bad across the board. I think, you know, as a conservative, as a Republican, I, I, I think that is, um, you know, the longer he's on, the worse for conservatives and Republicans. Um, so when people talk about canceling, you know, sometimes when you have somebody who's really odious on the other side, they're a helpful foil to attack. So I, I don't like him on there. I think he, he, all the things that conservatives care about, he distorts and perverts and, and, and shrinks the audience um, that conservatives are trying to reach. And that's the same thing with this new, um, whatever it's called, caucus that's been highlighted today that's also, you know, I mean, anything Marjorie Green is a disaster for Republicans anyway. But it does have an audience. She's getting money. Um, she's getting, you know, it's, you know, they're shaking down people for all these contributions saying that she's, you know, hey, I'm fighting for you. She's going to get nothing done. She'll never pass a bill. That'll be figured out pretty quickly. Hopefully she'll be primaried and she'll be gone. But, you know, don't give them more platform than they have and, and they'll, they'll be gone soon enough. Those, that kind of garbage doesn't last long. Todd, do you have any thoughts? Well, yeah, hi, thank you, Gabe. It's a good question, it's a hard question. Um, as my students know, I, I was Tucker's neighbor in Washington for many years and our daughters went to school together. I, I felt I knew him pretty well. Um, there was much I used to admire about his journalism when he wrote for Talk Magazine and he wrote for um, uh, the Weekly Standard and other publications. He would, I thought of him as a serious person. I, I think in the last X number of years, he's become a professional provocateur and entertainer, and his whole thing has been about building an audience. And I honestly, honestly have no idea what he really believes, whether he really believes the things he says now on television about white replacement and the rest of it. I'd like to hope he doesn't believe them, but if he's saying them while he doesn't believe them, it's almost worse than if he's you know, expressing a sincere, if misguided viewpoint. So, so I don't understand what is driving him beyond, you know, the desire to have an audience and influence. Um, 
so so that's that's the narrow personal answer about Tucker. As to the broader question, I just come back to what I said before that if, as Barbara said, people are making arguments that in some fundamental way are antithetical to what we are about as a society, and that includes a free society, which everyone's entitled to his own opinion, if not to his own facts, then ultimately I have to hope and have to believe that the marketplace and, and the vast public will winnow those, those views and those people out and reject them because, uh, you know, on balance, that's what's happened in American history. Sometimes it takes longer than we'd like it to. Sometimes a lot of bad and dangerous things happen in the interim, but usually that's what's happened. Ron, do you have any thoughts? You know, you can't, you can't really speak, um, Gabe, to what's in someone's heart. Um, you know, Todd knew Tucker for a long time. I've known him for probably the better part of 20 years. And, you know, good guy, Weekly Standard, Daily Caller. But unfortunately, I think I look at a reflection of society, and I think this is a lot of what society wants to hear, is they want to hear a provocateur, or they want to hear from an entertainer. And I looked to someone who I knew for many, many years, uh, Ann Coulter, who's you know made her money of writing books and saying very provocative things. And you talk to her off the air, and you say, now you don't really believe that, do you? And she's like, no, not really. But they get paid and they get paid millions of dollars. And I understand that and I appreciate it for what it is, but unfortunately it, for some, attracts an element that I think is a more sinister element of our society. I don't go on television every week and, and try to get clickbait and to make millions. I'd like to make millions and get clickbait, but I'd like to think that I'm helping people around the world understand what's going on in American politics and perhaps they step away with a different understanding of how Republicans and Democrats and independents approach issues rather than me spouting my opinion for the sake of fame and glory. Um, but unfortunately, I think a lot of our cable news content and the opinion side, it's people seeking opinion for fame and glory. Great, thanks Gabe, appreciate the question. Um, so that's it for the live questions today. Um, I have a couple, uh, I, I really just one student question uh, written in. This is from uh, Jade Bolton, who's actually uh, one of Barbara's students. Um, mm -hmm. Do you see political affiliation social media groups being a thing of the future? Although Parler was geared towards extremists, the idea of a political forum taking place via social media seems potentially promising in addition to campaigning through traditional social media. So I think the idea is, do you think that there might be a parlor type, though I don't know if parlor would agree with that, um, company, social media platform that is maybe geared towards organizing conservatives or organizing people on the left, that kind of thing. Does anybody have any thoughts on, on that potential? Well, well the, I mean, Donald Trump has said he's going to do it and others have said that. Parler, I guess, is trying to get back up and you know figure out how they can... Um, be in that square. I always think it's better, you know, instead of to be in an echo chamber, which is basically what Parler was trying to do, if you're really trying to engage in ideas, you want to be part of something where you have different viewpoints cl clashing, maybe somewhat politely would be nice, um, but at least, you know, engaging with some, you know, differing views. I mean, um, you know, if, if they you know, but they can do, you know, I mean, we, it, it's, it's a free country. We have a first amendment. It's a free market. If there's a market for that, um, for people to just talk to themselves, that's, that's fine. I don't think politically it's going to get anyone anywhere. And it certainly does. I mean, the problem with part, you know, parlor was they, you know, were, you, you know, you saw some of the extremism there that people were concerned about and everybody following January 6th is very concerned about what was the role that you know was played in that but i think you need to look first at what was the role played by donald trump and by the others who were promoting the big lie that's the big problem not mm -hmm. what outlet may have given voice to it because you know he was being covered live that day on a lot of the networks he probably was being covered live on um on talk radio and then he also you know obviously incited 
those group of people who headed down there and there was a lot of social media interaction and they were talking to each other when they were up on, on the Capitol. So there's all different ways that people who want to get enraged can get enraged. Um, you know, for people used to, you know, just another iteration back, it was email, sending around emails that were inciting yeah. things. Now, so there's always going to be something different, but I think you have to look at the Huey Longs of the world, for those of you who are old enough to remember Huey Long, or, you know, these provocateurs. And, you know, that's certainly what Donald Trump was. I think a Tucker Carlson is still responding to that. And then on the left, you have people who are doing that too. I just, you know, I, I like I tend to want to police my own side because I think they're harming my side politically. So that's why I make comments more about them than it was like, well, what about the left? And then what about ism? I, I just don't have any patience for because it's, you know, it's your house you need to be focusing on. Yeah, I, I don't like Ilhan Omar. I don't think she's a constructive contributor to, uh, you know, to the policy making either. But that's not my party. They they can deal with that. And, you know, I think she probably helped a lot of Republicans get elected last year. Mm -hmm. But, you know, yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll let others <laughs> chime in here. Ron, you want to go? No, Barbara's exactly right. This what about is, is a terrible element. And, and I think that what you see and, and one specific outlet that I'll call him out on is Newsmax. I used to go on Newsmax all the time years ago. And Chris Ruddy is a very young guy, very talented guy, a very smart guy, uh, who also has a place in Mar-a-Lago and also is a buddy of the president. And Newsmax went away from actually talking about news from a conservative standpoint to, they may as well have just have been the Donald Trump organ 24 seven saying all things Trump. And I look as, as Barbara articulated at January 6th, and a lot of people did a lot of things that day, but people on our side of the fence didn't hold the president responsible for what he said, what he did, what happened. And then most importantly for me, I mean, I was a staffer on the Hill forever. Barbara was a member of it, the worst moment of what was happening. The president's vice president was still up there at the time. He could have called these people and said, go home. He could have gone on social network and said, go home. And what did he do? He did nothing. And for those who say, well, maybe he didn't incite it or maybe he wasn't responsible for it, you know, the, the lawyer and me, I don't want to get in that. But as the leader of a country in very divisive times, he had, I think, a moral obligation to stand up and say enough's enough. And he failed. And not only did he fail, he said nothing for hours. And I think that gave a lot of people who were looking for stop the steal or the big lie or whatever you want to call it, coverage of, well, the president's with me, so I'm with the president. And I think that's done, I don't want to say irreparable harm to the country, but I think it has changed the way that we interact with each other as fellow citizens in a terrible way that's going to take us a long time to unpack that. Any thoughts, Tom? Well, I don't really have anything to add. To, I totally agree with what Barbara and Ron have said, except I would just add, chime in to say that I find whataboutism completely intolerable. And I hear, as we all do, my mother's voice in our head, my head, saying, you know, two wrongs don't make a right. And it doesn't matter. I mean, the, 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 the antidote to wrongdoing in your own household is not to point out that your neighbor is also doing wrong. It's, it's to stop the wrongdoing. And I think that that's, you know, that's just something that we've, has become a pernicious problem. And, and, and you know, I think there's dishonesty on both sides, but I mean, I do think that Ron and Barbara are correct to point out that uh, way too many mainstream congressional Republican office holders failed to, you know, hold Donald Trump to account for January 6th, which makes the, the actions of someone like Liz Cheney all the more remarkable in mm -hmm. hindsight uh, for her willingness to do that. Yeah, Ron, you brought up uh, Newsmax and I, I did have a question in my own head, which is I remembered after the election, there was all this talk about Newsmax and OAN taking all these viewers away from, from Fox and it's been you know six months or so now, maybe a little more. Um, I'm curious what, I don't know if anybody has any thoughts on that idea? D is there a market or a way for Newsmax or OAN to 
you know, take a little bit of the monopoly. I think that Fox News has had among conservative viewers and especially in the cable world uh, now or in the future, or maybe we'll, you know, Donald, I know he has friends with, with I think Ruddy is the CEO of Newsmax. Will Trump just take off Newsmax and maybe that's where we get Trump TV? I don't know. Does anybody have thoughts on that? Well, I, I don't think there's going to be a Trump TV because, listen, this is a guy when he was president who was mostly sitting upstairs, you know, watching TV and not doing his work. So, and, you know, the same with the people around him who really aren't capable of, um, you know, of running something like that. So, you know, if, if you're uh, the Murdoch family or if you're Chris Reddy, you're not worried about the competition of the guy who's, you know, bankrupted <laughs> companies left and right, as well as lost the House, Senate, and the White House. So I, I don't see that happening. I think that's some, again, I think there's this whole um, industry around Trump and sort of the sort of the incompetent hangers on there who are just trying to make a buck for a few more years. And that's going to keep this alive. But I think people get, I think it gets too much um, voice on the media, not just on um, say Fox News where, you know, Matt Gates was a regular, you know, you know on, on Tucker Carlson's show, but on, but on other shows where they're talk, giving them more voice. And I think the perfect example of that was, you know, when they went, took on Liz Cheney, they were running around saying, A, we've gotten a majority of the caucus or something to that effect to sign on and say she's got to go. And, and the press was all, oh, is she going to survive? Is she going to survive? Well, not only did she survive, you know, she, she survived with a huge vote, you know, two thirds. Now, one third of the caucus has always been cranks, no matter where, you know, read John Boehner's book. So even before Trump, you always had that problem. So she won with a strong two thirds. And there really wasn't the reporting after that, wait, Matt Gates and all these guys said they had the signatures of all these people. Well, they didn't, they were just lying. And so a lot of times everyone gets worked up that, oh no, these guys are coming. And like what Donald Trump has always done is he's created this false image of himself. Remember, what did he call it when he was calling around and, you know, trying to get himself on the front page of the New York Post and he, he made up his press guy and talked to people and made up stories. You got to remember that that's who he is and that's who this team is and not give them so much airtime or so much credibility because when the rubber meets the road, they just don't get it done. No, Harry, let me, let, me, let me speak to this very quickly because I think what Barbara said here, there are a couple of things that she said here that are very important. She and I are conservative Republicans. If you look at Matt Gates and you look at Jim Jordan and you look at any number of the, whatever caucus that you want to call them, the hanger on caucus to Trump, and I think it manifests itself with Newsmax, that these people want to hang on and they want to make a buck. They're not interested in legislating. They're not interested in advancing the needle. Liz Cheney has been a friend of mine for 21 years. And to listen to these folks who go on TV and use those platforms to denigrate people who are trying to get things done as opposed to getting on these platforms to try to promote themselves, I think is despicable. And we have to patrol our own house. And, and Barbara is exactly right that if Republicans don't stand up to those within our caucus, who I think are doing terrible damage to us, and we need to be about addition rather than subtraction, we need more voters. We need more people who look like her, more people who look like me to come out and say, I want to fly under the conservative banner. But if all you see and hear is Matt Gates and Jim Jordan, and you're looking at folks on Newsmax and those platforms, we're in trouble. Todd, any, we're about to wrap up here. Any final thoughts? No, I don't really have anything to add. I, I've just been looking in the Q&A box though, Harry, and I'm puzzled about why there are any anonymous attendees in this gathering and why they're asking questions. And uh, I, I'm not gonna engage with that, but I, I just, I thought we we're all kind of a SC family here. And it's just a little shocking to me that that's going on. But anyway, I, I think that the fundamental thing about Trump that we have to remember whatever happens in the future is he, above everything else, he's averse to work. He doesn't want to do the work it would take to do something like run a television uh, outlet or, uh, you know, if somebody else is willing to do it for him and he just appears from time to time, that's fine. But I can't imagine that he has the wherewithal to creatively get behind that and, and organize something like that. 
Okay, great. That sounds good. It is uh, top of the hour. So uh, that wraps it up for our final fellows roundtable um, for the spring semester. Uh, we will probably be, we will be back. Uh, hopefully we'll do some kind of in-person quasi future fellows programming in the fall, but we'll have to wait and see for that. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Thank you to our amazing panelists, Barbara, Ron, and Todd. Thank you to our USC students, and thank you all for joining us and spending some time with us. And we will see you next time.